Next up, we're honored to have Dr. Reggie Brothers join us to moderate a discussion on achieving security outcomes through AI. Dr. Brothers is the CEO of New Wave Solutions and the former Undersecretary for Science and Technology at the Department of Homeland Security. He's also the uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research at uh, DOD, and he's held positions at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA. So welcome, Reggie. It's wonderful to have you with us today. There we go. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> well, we've got a few poll questions we put together. As you know, we talked about that in sure. advance to sure. help uh, inform and, and uh, this discussion we're about to have. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd ready to uh, poll, poll the audience. Let's do it. All right. First question. Um, okay. Now, these questions, uh, I'll, I'll read it out. It says, attacks on artificial intelligence and machine learning systems have been described as fundamentally different from traditional cyber attacks. Does your organization have a strategy in place to protect against adversarial AI ML system attacks? You know, we um, talked a little bit about adversarial AI and ML in the previous discussion, panel discussion. So I expect we'll get back into that a little bit now uh, with your, your panel discussion, Reggie. So we do. I think this is one of the areas, you know, I think we've heard just a tremendous amount of information from the other panels. Um, we went from uh, just basic understanding of AI, ML, or particular machine learning, um, to applications of AI, ML. Um, smart cities, then we had a lot of talk about handling the data, the management of data. But fundamental to all this is the security implications. And so one of the areas that we do plan to address is security um, in this next panel. So looking forward to that conversation. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, operator, would you mind bringing up the, uh, the results from that, that last poll? All right. 25% yes, 17% no. 19% somewhat, and 36% I don't know. And I think that's a good answer, though. You know, it's an honest answer. And this, uh, it's, uh, it, you know, for our purposes, honesty is, is, uh, is the golden rule here. So, we know, Chris, I think it's, it's an important honest answer because while we become familiar with cybersecurity principles, um, these area, this area of the security, the assurance of artificial intelligence systems is, is somewhat different and with different attack modalities. And that's something I think we've got some expertise in the panel to really should we talk about? Well, well, this next polling question is going to stretch your, your mind a little bit. At least it did for me. Um, and I'm hoping we'll, uh, we'll learn a, a little bit more about the nuances of, of, of each of these uh, items that come up. But uh, operator, can you bring up the next question? Um, oh, this is, I, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. What is your top AL ML security concern? So um, we had model extraction attacks. Uh, adversarial examples, data poisoning attacks, and model evasion attacks. You know, I'm not sure what some of those are at all. So I'm I'm hoping that you'll you'll be uh, helping to educate me and probably some of the other folks online today. Well, I think it'll be interesting given the results of the last question. How many folks understand the distinction between these kind of attacks, right? Because these are things that we can we can go through in, in some detail. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, then let's uh, bring up the results there. If, uh, hopefully people had a chance. Poison attacks, uh, data poisoning attacks, number one. I'm sure that's probably the, the maybe a reflection of what we are more familiar with because that would have been uh, my, my choice as well. But uh, across the board, uh, 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 model extraction at 17%, adversarial examples 26 and Model evasion attacks nine percent. Actually, I got there's a lot of people out there that really I think know what's going on here a little better than I do. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit back at this point, turn things over to you, Dr. Brothers. Uh, have a great discussion. I'm gonna be taking some notes. Well, I really do appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, let me go quickly and, and introduce the panel. Uh, so we have Dr. Jeff Alston. Uh, he's a program manager of the um, IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency which is part of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. We have Major uh, Nathaniel Bastian, uh, PhD, who is the Chief Artificial Intelligence Scientist at the JAKE, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. And I'd like to give you a little more detail on that in just a second. And we have Mr. Paul Milson, who is the Master Principal uh, uh, Software as a, as a System Solution Engineer for Oracle. And we have Ms. Je uh, Gretchen Stewart, who is the Public Sector Data Science Technology Director 
Uh, for U.S. Enterprise and Government, the Sales and Marketing Group with the Intel Corporation. So it's a real pleasure to have all of you here and look forward to, uh, I'm very looking forward to the, uh, the conversation. So as I think we said, um, as I mentioned early, um, if, I had a chance to listen to the earlier panel sessions. And the early panel sessions, uh, they really started out with just kind of a basic definition of what machine learning is, uh, went through some potential applications of it. There was some conversation of security concerns. And then the last one, there was, they're really trying to talk about what do you need to do to operationalize um, AI for, for, for the edge user. Uh, a lot of talk about data and data management, in these kind of areas. Um, what I'd like to do in this panel, we, we talked about this, was focus on two issues um, that may not be focused on enough. In fact, one of the panelists of the first discussion even said, you know, this whole AI security space may not be getting enough attention. Um, and then the other area that I'd like to talk about, and um, I think there's another area that gets some attention, maybe not enough, is really if we're going to efficiently use um, AI, how do we do the teaming with men, men and machines? And in the first, um, in the first uh, panel session, um, there was a reference made to um, uh, AI beating uh, chess champions, beating Go champions, these kinds of things. What we also know is that some average players have beaten um, computers when they have used um, advanced computer systems as well. And what we found is that the, the human machine teaming gives advantages over just plain um, AI systems. And I'd like to, if we have time to get into that as well. What I'd like to do then is to start out, if you don't mind, and give kind of a broad contextual background. And to do that, um, I'd like to start out, um, Nate, if you could start talking to um, the Jake and some of the overarching things that you're looking into, and then we'll dr drill down into some more specific topics. Yeah, absolutely. And I do, I do apologize. Uh, I've had some technical difficulties today with, with my video. So I'm going to try to keep getting it to work at government computer. So, but, but I will dig in. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so as so the Jake, uh, just, just for quick, who we are, where we are, uh, the, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, we fall under the, the DOD Chief Information Officer, which is under the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And, and we really were created to help execute uh, the, the 2018 uh, DOD AI strategy. And, and one of those kind of pillars of that is sort of committed to leading in military ethics and AI safety. And actually, in part of, as part of that strategy document, it says that in, in order for DOD AI systems, you know, to, 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 you know, deliver them, they must be safe, secure, robust, and that we're going to fund work into systems that have lower risks of accidents, uh, are more resilient to include hacking and, and adversarial spoofing and the like. And so in general, when we're thinking about the resiliency of AI systems, in general, we can bucket these into adversarial AI, uh, which are sort of countermeasures that adversaries, adversaries might deploy against our AI systems, and then the evaluation steps and defenses needed to safeguard performance. Um, and then also trustworthy AI, which is those procedures, practices, and measures to ensure AI performance is, is accurate and, and, and reproducible with characterized limitations. And so when we look at uh, in sp uh, specifically adversarial AI, typically it's important to consider um, well, first, you know, these types of AI systems, for example, a, a computer vision system, um, you know, they see, you know, very differently than humans, right? And it's all about mapping relationships between features and, and, and in unintuitive ways, right? And so adversarial techniques can really uncover those relationships and craft uh, inputs, if you will, to elicit a, a desired response. Um, and so in general, we, we typically have a, an access paradigm for how we view uh, the sort of landscape of adversarial AI attacks. Think of this as the, the knowledge that the attacker has of the targeted AI system. And, we, and, and typically, we, we bucket this into three sort of categories, the first being a, a white box paradigm. Um, and so in general, in this type of access, the, adversarial, the adversary has a complete knowledge of that AI uh, implementation of the AI system, the state, software, data, weights, input and output values, um, you know, anything um, sort of just all knowledge about sort of the model and the overall system architecture in general. 
Whereas in a black box paradigm, the adversary, the adversary has no access to the internal information of the AI system, but what they can do is they can repeatedly like probe with different input output pairs to infer what that inner state is. Um, and then third is the, the hidden box paradigm. And this is where uh, the adversary, you know, they must, they make some assumptions about the AI model, including its existence sometimes by just observing or it can be revealed through its overall system behavior. Um, and so given these, these, these sort of three paradigms, um, in general, we can bucket these into three types of uh, attacks or three categories. Now, there are some more emerging ones, and they start, you know, binning these into new emerging ones. But the, the main three um, that I know Jeff from IARPA is very focused on, and I am as well, to Jake and, and those on the panel here, but it really comes down to poisoning attacks. Uh, evasion attacks and model inversion attacks. And, and there are some, some new ones, like I said, emerging. But in general, a poisoning attack is, um, comes down to an adversary polluting the, the training data to skew the decision boundary and the overall model behavior, okay? And so, you know, this is really, uh, it's common in systems that, that must rely on observations in the operational domain for, for, for its training data. Um, you know, Jeff's program, Troja AI, it's about these Trojans, so it's poisoning uh, the data that's used to train. So for example, if you think of a, a, an AI used for spam detection, uh, you know, this can be trained on adversarial user input, or user feedback would incorrectly classify some types of spam emails as non-spam emails. Um, this could be really hard to prove uh, due to the prevalence of different like transfer learning techniques, you know, that have come up in, in other pre-trained algorithms. So that's focus on the training, poisoning the data used to train a model. Um, when it comes to an evasion attack, this is probably the most common adversarial AI use case uh, in, in this evasion attack. The inputs are engineered. We call these adversarial examples but they're engineered to cause uh, the, the classifier um, to assign the input to an erroneous class. So this is a model that's already been trained um, and now it's uh, an adversary is trying to sort of fool uh, that classifier. Um, and so uh, the third type is the model inversion. This is the, the least public, uh, publicized attack category. It's, it's often the most difficult to execute, um, but it carries some serious uh, privacy and data security implications. And so in this type of attack, an attacker repeatedly probes the AI system to extract information about the model configuration um, or the embedded training data. Um, so think of this as kind of, hey, I, uh, I probe the system and I kind of reverse engineer sort of, uh, sort of the learning that took place um, to extract, hey, what data it was used um, to train this particular model, for example. And so in general, those are the, the three types. Um, and so I guess I'll pass it back and I'll try to get my video working <laughs> over. Jeff, I want to go over to you. Um, um, could you talk about, you know, Nate gave us some background on what the types of attacks are. Could you talk about the impact of some of those? What, what some of the consequences are? And then go into some of the research that you're doing to try to understand how to mitigate, to characterize and mitigate those things. So the consequences of an AI misbehaving are purely defined by what you've hooked up the AI to, right? So if you have uh, a spam detector for email, the consequences of somebody having uh, sort of used or put in a security hole into that or just a normally occurring error are going to be that someone's going to get some spam that they weren't otherwise supposed to get. That is unlikely to be a, a huge issue. If you had, say, a lethal autonomous weapon that was running around in a battlefield, uh, then the, the consequences could be much greater. And in fact, if you had any sort of military defense system that was being used in peacetime, but was critical to uh, the decision to go to war, that would be even worse, right? So it's purely determined by what you are using these, these things for. And uh, I'm very thankful that the Department of Defense with their AI ethical principles has identified the sort of scale element of this and that this last element of we need to uh, know when things are going wrong and being able to shut them down is if they're misbehaving is, is really a great one. So of the AI ethical principles, the last one is uh, governable. And that's the one that I'm most excited about because it requires the Department of Defense to be able to know when their AIs are misbehaving and to be able to sort of pull the plug on them 
Uh, and thus that would prevent us from getting into these situations where an AI has a heck of a lot writing on it, because if we had a security or safety problem occur, then it could be uh, very bad. So I'm thankful the Department of Defense and the intelligence community has been thinking about this for a while. So what is what are you doing at IARPA um, regarding this? So as Nate mentioned, I run research programs on AI security, uh, AI for computer vision, and, and other things. And the AI security program that I run is Troj AI, standing for Trojans and Artificial Intelligence. And what we're trying to do is detect if an AI has a Trojan or backdoor put inside it. And so this could have come to be because uh, some bad person got into your training data and manipulated it. So that's data poisoning. It sounded like half of the people who responded to the poll uh, were sort of cognizant of that. It's worth noting that technically speaking, you could put in a Trojan, not by manipulating the training data, but by doing surgery directly on the neural network. Mm -hmm. That's only been shown in a few toy examples uh, so far, but it is a prospect as, as we continue to advance our understanding. So if, you're concerned about backdoors or Trojans, you could say, well, I'm just going to protect my data and I'm gonna protect everything about the development uh, process so that no one can get in there and put in a backdoor. Good, you can do this. Uh, but that whole supply chain running into your AI is really very long, very distributed, and reaches back to China and other places. When you talk about the chips and the, the algorithms that are being used and the code bases and, and so on. So uh, we have taken the approach of, we're not going to try to prevent attacks from happening. We just want to know if it happens. Because if you know that there's a backdoor, then you can take actions to, to mitigate that. The problem is, is that basically no one on the planet knew how to do that up until relatively recently. And so the people who now have some semblance of an idea of how to do this are IARPA uh, funded researchers. And I'm, I'm very happy to be running a team of uh, people from 10 different research institutions and companies uh, around the United States that are working on this problem. Our testing and evaluation is being done by NIST, the National Institutes of Standard Technology. And you can look at our Trojai leaderboard to see what the latest that's being done by IARPA funded researchers and others to try to uh, address this problem. And it's an area that really is not just at the cutting edge of AI security, but interacts with other issues of AI security. So Nate was talking about adversarial examples or evasion attacks. So AIs can screw up due to adversaries having deliberately put in back doors, but uh, they can also just screw up because they're screwed up, right? They just errors happen and sort of naturally occurring camouflage or optical illusions that can fool AIs um, happens in them already. And so for our Trojan AI program, we have built up a code base that lets us produce thousands of AIs uh, that are clean or have back doors in them. And so then we use this as our test set to say, can you build a Trojan detector? Show me which one's which, right? And we uh, had an issue uh, that many of these AIs were just sort of like naturally producing errors anyway, these naturally occurring optical illusions or camouflage, these adversarial examples. And it made it really tricky to figure out which one was which because they were both screwed up in, in different ways, right? Uh, thankfully, the, the state of our understanding of AI security has advanced a lot in the last few years. So we started uh, developing AIs using the latest training techniques to uh, squash down and mitigate these adversarial examples, these naturally occurring uh, issues. And so our clean AIs look a heck of a lot more clean. And so now there's more signal that lets you distinguish whether or not an attack has occurred. And I think that this is the kind of understanding that we're going to have to have in, in the future, realizing that the state of play of security is going to continue to change and advance. And so that will both enable us to do certain things and disable our ability to do certain things that were working. So that's part of what makes it a very um, intellectually interesting field to be in, but it's also uh, very nerve wracking when you think about actually using these things for uh, safety or security critical missions. You know, th thanks, for that, Jeff. Um, I'm interested. Um, I want to go to J Gretchen real quick, but I am interested at some point in understanding. You know, how cyber security has has the kill chain that's been developed. Is whether or not there's an AI security kill chain, right, at, for the various different types of uh, canonical attacks that that Nate mentioned. But let's get back to that later. Uh, Gretchen, um, so you exist at kind of the intersection of the hardware and software, right? You you do both of these. What? How? How? From Intel's perspective, how from your perspective, are you thinking about some of these security issues? 
So first, thanks for uh, having me as part of this. I, um, I will continue to learn every moment as we're all discussing. But um, I think part of the what Intel tries to do first is a public-private partnership. So we already work with folks from IARPA. We have jointly invested in a number of AI research centers with um, the NSF. Uh, we also work with NIST in terms of designing and looking at what the right standards are to ensure that hardware and software are really designed in that way. So you think about the hardware itself and we look at how can we encrypt to to the highest level, each component, whether it be memory, whether it be CPU, can we even do that per, for peripherals that maybe we don't even build, but that somebody else builds? Um, and, and we go literally all the way back, think of, as we were talking about zero trust or a fully trusted environment, all the way back to the components that are building. So to build our silicon, you're talking about sand and lots of other components. Um, and we go all the way back to ensure that we understand where we got those and how that goes through in terms of the whole build process. And when we're talking about um, components that we built in, like the ability to create a secure enclave so that you have the ability from a VM perspective to target a certain amount of core, not all the core, but some of the core in the CPU, memory, storage, and peripherals as an example, and ensure that those are encrypted um, so creating those kinds of things within the hardware and then providing the software tools that sit above that. So kernel libraries, um, all the tools that like a, a SaaS or that a Google will leverage from a TensorFlow perspective and help optimize all of those to ensure to take the capabilities that are built into the hardware. So that you have that combination of hardware and software that are really ensuring and creating the encryption that you need. And also if we do see something that we absolutely move it off any kind of track um, to be able to be processed um, from a hardware perspective. So again, we understand it's about both. Um, and we want to absolutely ensure that from the bare metal perspective that all the tools that sit on top of it are taking advantage and are ensuring that they have the highest levels of security. Are you comfortable with, do you think this, this issue is getting enough, um, enough attention right now? And uh, what do you think are some future directions we should take as we're looking at the integration of the hardware and software and trying to assure, you, you're talking about from supply chain perspective, but, but you know, going forward, what are some things you think we should think, be thinking about? Well, I, I know that we are definitely looking at um, that intersection of software and hardware that, you know, you can't, a lot of the AI applications are developed. Um, and I think somebody earlier had talked about lots of times they develop them on a cloud. Um, and then they take that information and maybe use it in a private environment that you've got in, in your location. Um, or maybe it's a combination of a multi-cloud environment plus some of the information locally. So how do you ensure that you've got the right storage and that you've tiered it in a way that you're ensuring that, it's, that it has the right encryptions and that if you're encrypting or decrypting, how do you ensure across the entire data journey that that's really happening? So when we're designing or thinking about sensors or things that we've designed at the end, like uh, edge, like VPU, et cetera, how do we ensure that that is encrypted? And then as it moves along the journey, maybe to a gateway where the gateway wants to decrypt, look at that, decide to take some actions or not take actions, re-encrypt and then move it along the way. So those are the things that we're looking at. And truthfully, we know that you know, Intel doesn't have all the answers, which is part of the reason why we continue to work with IARPA or we are creating those AI um, centers because it is a public-private partnership. And we want to ensure that what we design um, is the most secure and the most capable to, to help everyone who's trying to build the best algorithms that they can or leverage the algorithms and frameworks that are already available. Thank you, Gretchen. And that was a great segue to Paul. <laughs> um, to talk about cloud, right? So Paul, when, when Oracle's thinking about security, we're kind of moving up the stack, right? So, so now we're thinking about the cloud instantiation of, of these tools. What kind of security concerns uh, does Oracle have? And what, what, what are the mitigating steps that you take? Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, pleasure to be here. Tremendous learning experience. And again, um, from the Oracle perspective, um, you know, the concerns around cloud, you know, Essentially, you think about the cloud from the standpoint of security. 
Um, we're doing a lot of being able to put embedded AI in, into our applications, uh, really being able, and particularly around anomaly detection, to be able to take log files, activity, session activity, location, business activity, business user, um, to be able to take all of that data, to be able to analyze it, and, and then be able, based on that, to be identifying anomalies. Um, that tends, it's interesting, you know, we kind of step back for a second, you look at a lot of our, our customers, they don't have maybe the resources, the technical resources, the ability, the data to build models, to be able to build those on their own. Uh, so what we're doing is building a lot of that, both at the database level, so our database uh, can detect and can repair based on attacks, both in the middleware level, and then also on the application level, where you know we can be able to analyze transactions within the application, to be able to identify anomalies, and, and then be able to direct that to, to the appropriate person based on the, the appropriate risk profile. Um, so are these specific tools that you develop for the anomaly detection in your cloud, or this is where you're leveraging other tools? These are actually in our cloud. These are tools that we have developed and put into our applications. Um, again, because, it, you know, for the majority of our customers, it, it is very difficult to be able to, to develop these tools, to be able to develop the logic, to be able to train the models, uh, and to be able to deploy them. And so we want to be able to develop an application stack that's really self-detecting, self-repairing, and um, you know, one that has those controls embedded into it. So thank you. One thing I'd like to just kind of pose to the, to the, to the panel, um, I think it was 1998 that um, there was a group of hackers uh, called the Loft that went to the Senate to try to warn, uh, warn the, the Hill about the dangers of cybersecurity. Um, from that time onward, we've made a lot of advances in the knowledge of cybersecurity and tools and these kinds of things, detection methods, mitigation, et cetera. Where do you think we are with respect to AI security? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very amused at, at how you said 98. Uh, that, that makes sense in the context of the internet. But when I often tell people about how I see the current lay of the land for AI security, I often reference the 80s and the 70s where yeah. people were building out IT infrastructure without a lot of thought for cybersecurity. And now we're dealing with the consequences uh, of that today. And I don't just mean businesses buying solutions, but also the, the kinds of technology that people were developing, right? So uh, it could have been the case that uh, like memory buffer overflow attacks are just not a thing, but we made certain decisions several decades ago about how we designed chips and now we're stuck with them, right? So I would love it to be the case that we don't repeat that same sort of mistakes with AI. I think we are looking at a lot of great techniques for using AI and we're eager to put these into different contexts. Uh, but unfortunately, some of them are sort of like fundamentally broken and some of them are not fundamentally broken, but we really need to figure out how to make it more secure or more safe now before we go build a whole infrastructure industry, et cetera, that's baking in certain ways of, of doing business. So that's what I'm trying to sort of head off at the pass. But uh, thankfully, AI is, is really taking off and so having uh, a lot of effects. So it's sort of a race here between yeah. those that are trying to make the system more secure and safe and those that are trying to use it for a mission. Yeah, uh, can, can I add to that real quick? Yeah, please. yeah I think, um, you know, this is still very heavy in, in research and development, hem hence Jeff's program and others at DARPA and the different service labs. Um, a lot of the focus to date has been mostly at the model level. Um, so I think even from a system level, you know, and we have multiple components to be different AI components, how do they, you know, how do they work together, um, having robustness metrics or certifications for a whole system. And, and many of those trade off from an explainability perspective, right? If we want, you know, trusted AI, well, that's it's sort of a conflicting objectives, right? Maybe, you know, we have robustness, but we also have safety and explainability and, and aiding to trust, right? So I trust it because it's robust, but I trust mm -hmm. it because it's explainable. And a lot of times, though, many times at the, you know, at the model architecture level, those are trade-offs that you're making. And so that's, so we're, we have a ways to go. Um, so I'll leave it at that.
I appreciate and, it. And to, to add on to what both Nate and Jeff have said, um, is, is you're absolutely right. When, you, when um, people really started to initially look at processor design, security was one of the things, but I'm certain that it was a little below the line, if you know what I mean. Um, but now it is absolutely part of the design center from, from our perspective. And so there are things that we are adding not only into firmware, but into the hardware itself. And so when you really think about the multiple gates and how you need to really move throughout the processor, where really um, security is being designed in and creating enclaves and the ability to do those sorts of things. But you're absolutely right. Things like side channel and others where you could get in between user and kernel were not things that people even thought anybody would do. Um, and so absolutely now the interesting part is we're a hardware company, but we have over 15,000 software engineers. And, and that probably wasn't true 20 or 30 years ago. Don't quote me because I didn't work for Intel 20 or 30 years ago. But you know what I mean? We've got a lot more software engineers and people who are really working intimately with the hardware to ensure that security is part of the design center and that it is all the way down to the hardware and that all those tools take advantage of what's available there so that somebody who is designing AI doesn't need to know all of that, but it is built in based on the tools that they're using. Is there anything to build on this also just uh, real quickly? Um, one of the issues we have is around data. And so many of the organizations that we deal with um, really don't have a lot of quality data. Data is in multiple systems. It's in, in multiple validation. There's no governance over it. Uh, and it often ends up being a data and data science, you know, trying to repair all this data before you can even get to, to building the models and being able to test them. It uh, tends to be a very difficult thing. Well, let, let, let's pull on that a little bit. I mean, what are you seeing, you know, this, this push towards the cloud, data lakes, these kinds of things. Um, what are some of your concerns there? In the last panel, the first panel I talked about data provenance, these kinds of things. Uh, what are some things that, that you think we need to be thinking about as we all start expanding into this, this distributed data environment? from a security perspective? What, what I'm seeing for pe when people are really beginning to just define their data strategy, because you really mm -hmm. do need one. Um, and, and honestly, our chief data architect, chief data scientist lives in DC for the very reason that we're all on, on this panel together. The government has the most amount of data probably across the globe. And really ensuring from the beginning when you think about that data strategy, what is the security component of that? Are there, is it 256 bit encryption or is it high? You know, what, what are the com components that you wanna ensure that are built in from the beginning on your entire data strategy? And then when you're upgrading the infrastructure and so on and so forth, you're really ensuring that you have built um, that from the ground up, if you know what I mean. And, yeah. and that's what I'm starting to see people begin to think about but it still feels like a multi-headed hydra and people are not quite including security at the beginning where I think you really need to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you see that particularly at a lot of my clients are in the Department of Defense and um, being able to put data governance, um, just block and tackling data governance, understand where your data is, what the format of it is, um, being able to put controls over it. And then, you know, almost with that putting a data strategy in place that includes uh, security is, is really all important. And, and it's really kind of a fundamental step, um, at least in the DOD, I'm just seeing a lot of organizations um, really seriously undertake now. I'm curious, Nate, from the, I mean, the Jake has got a, a, a huge mission, huge charter, right? Um, and you, you run to the CIO's office. How are you thinking about the, the, these data management kind of issues, um, kind of department, strategically, if you will? Yeah, great question. Um, so under the, the CIO, we do have uh, five modernization pillars, and I'll, I'll just use this to frame my answer. Uh, AI is just one of them. We also have cyber, cloud, uh, command control and communications, um, and now data. So actually, as of two months ago, we, we now have a, a CDO, uh, Mr. Dave Spurk came up from SOCOM. Um, and so actually, just last week, uh, I believe his office, uh, which is just a couple of people, um, released the DOD data strategy. 
And so I'd say before data became a pillar, right, you know, the Jake and a lot of our uh, initial uh, sort of products and, and just for situational awareness, we have about 35 AI products in the funnel at different stages across six verticals, uh, spanning joint warfighting operations, joint information warfare, joint logistics, warfighter health, uh, business process transformation, and uh, missing one. Uh, anyway, one, one other one, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll come to me. But you, you can imagine a lot of these, uh, I'll just call them, if we call them use cases, uh, the majority of the effort has been on, has been a data digitization focus, right? The data is just not ready. What does that mean? Unpacking that, almost having a consulting model. Uh, yeah, you know, you might have a lot of data, but is it the right data? So, so for example, you know, we have a, a maritime search and rescue uh, product uh, lead that we're maturing. And it's like, we're able to secure, you know, 20 million images, you know, and it's like, well, how many of those images actually have one object that we care about detecting, let alone a lot of objects of over a hundred different objects we want to sort of detect in a, in an image. Right. So it's, we may have a lot of it, but is it the right data uh, for this problem or is it representative for whatever the use case? Um, so that's been a, a lot of the initial seed efforts. Um, anyway, so the focus has been on data for AI product development. Um, that's been the focus, but um, just data in general, you know, we established a, a data governance working group within the Jake um, to make decisions on, uh, you know, what do we, you know, what data do we ingest into our joint common foundation that we're building? Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to do with it? Um, we, we piloted some uh, best practices. So if you think of uh, AI engineering best practices, one of the best practices uh, is this uh, data to model traceability into kind of, you know, data provenance and those types of things. But to get after that, we leveraged Google's initial work on data, car data cards and model cards um, to be able to get after, you know, wh what is the data, you know, and, and capturing all the sort of meta features of the data, um, not only to just store it and, and create a, a, um, a repository and also a catalog that others across the duty can, can leverage and, and, you know, do a search from and see what's available, but also for, for data provenance purposes. We've done the same thing with model cards as well to track how a model, you know, changes in versions over time, this has been extremely critical, you know, very different than, than enterprise, enterprise applications. But, you know, a lot of the work we have to do, uh, for example, one of our products we built um, in response to COVID-19, what it's called Project Salus. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a humanitarian logistics uh, uh, sort of supply chain type application that we used to support the NORTHCOM commander and the National Guard Bureau leadership with a lot of the medical logistic type resource allocation decisions post, you know, uh, does that here post pandemic or during the pandemic, you know, key, key decisions around, you know, what, what, uh, you know, where are the hot spots going to be for food shortages or other medical supplies? You know, where do I send uh, certain, you know, uh, types of, of supplies and, and how many, you know, how do I staff them? Those types of decisions, right? So we built, uh, first thing we did was we, uh, we built a data platform and we, we searched uh, and brought in over 70 different data sets um, mm -hmm. spanning, you know, uh, open source uh, stuff that different vendors gave for free, like, you know, food supply chain companies, things like that. Some government stuff, operational data. But first we had to build the data platform because it didn't exist. You know, so we built the data platform in a way that then we could bring in, you know, I think we ended up bringing in seven or so different performers um, to actually build different AI applications on top of the platform. So you can imagine having to bring in 70 different data sources and, and from a policy side and understanding what is this data, what isn't this data, how does it sort of interact, not necessarily at the technical level, but on the policy level with mm -hmm. other data sets. Um, and especially in a situation where the DOD is supporting uh, sort of a, a US type operation, which, you know, uh, you know, typically we don't do, right? So we're kind of supporting FEMA, but not really supporting NORTHCOM. So there's a lot of um, sticky issues around the, <laughs> just what we can do and how we can support, let alone the data and how they are fused together and let alone the AI uh, applications that we're building on top of this for different predictive analytics things. So data management for that was key. 
Um, and so in building this data platform, a lot of the functionality we, we built into this was automating the, the, the construction of these data cards and model cards as new data sets come and go. Um, so we've kind of, uh, that's, so we have a data management process here at the Jake and a lot of those lessons learned, uh, we've sort of shared with the new chief data officer. Um, he, you know, he's going to, he's going to own data management and government governance for the DOD. Um, but when it comes to preparing and curating and conditioning, um, and just storing data Data, uh, whether it be for AI or any advanced uh, analytics uh, that can be done, there's certainly a connection there. We're, we're, we're at the hip um, with that and actually t t together, um, we're actually uh, creating some new acquisition mechanisms to help the DoD help themselves with regards to data readiness. And we're, we're pushing out a data readiness multiple award contract to help, like I said, the DoD components and services get their data ready across the spectrum of volume and, and velocity and variety and all, however many Vs you want to use um, to make it ready, uh, you know, for themselves, uh, let alone for the Jake to help them with. So hopefully that answers your question. That was a great answer. I really appreciate it. Appreciate that. So listen, we are almost out of time. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of go around. Um, and if you could just tell folks, we've got a, you, you may have seen the surveys earlier, the kinds of, we've got industry, we've got legislators, we've got former, former government folks, government folks, et cetera. We really, we stuck to the AI security piece, data security. What's the last word? What would you like to let, take, have people take away from this, uh, this panel session in that area? And we'll go in reverse order from start. Paul, we'll start with you. Um, I think that uh, that AI has tremendous potential uh, around cyber security. Um, I think there's still some limitations and um, that um, they should continue to investigate it and it'll continue to develop. But right now, it, 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 tremendous opportunity, tremendous potential. I, right now, I don't think it's a panacea of uh, being able to take care of all the security needs. Great. Thank you. Gretchen? I think if there's one thing I could leave is there should be and there always will be a human in the loop. I think that there is a lot of great information. I mean, um, there are things that Oracle does as an example can can do, um, you know, not only compression, but can look and de do dedupe so that you don't have three times the, the same amount of information because the data scientist keeps recreating things. Um, but at the same time, when you think about um, the, the combination of the technology and the information, there really does have to be somebody who is looking at that and doing the compare and who really has that domain knowledge. Yeah. Cause that's one yeah. of the other things I see a lot is that you have a lot of people who are hiring data scientists and, and, and brilliant people happen to be one myself. Um, but, but the truth is you really need the domain expertise. So for border patrol, you need to really understand what those folks are having to deal with every day. And so the combination of great information and great data with a human is, you know, that is the panacea. Great, so thank you so much for bringing that out. That, that's an area, you know, we talked about, would like to bring up, but I just wasn't sure clear we had time to actually explore it. So thanks for bringing that up. Jeff. So under the right conditions with the right people and data and so on, AI can be very, very powerful. But uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So we need to be aware that as we're using these AIs in very high impact situations, things going wrong could get arbitrarily bad to unlimited levels of bad, particularly if you're talking national security. And so we need to, to not be sort of um, eager to, to just get something deployed. We need to be very sure that we're not making the world or the United States a, a worse place by virtue of having some of these things deployed. Sometimes the answers to that are uh, simply like have a human in the loop. And when that is both uh, technically true and sort of operationally possible, that's great. Uh, that will not always be the case. And so sometimes the answer should be, yes, this AI can work in principle, but the risks of using it are simply too high in practice. And so we won't, will not use it, right? Uh, that is sometimes a second solution. And then hopefully there will be third and fourth solutions where we have new technical sort of uh, solutions for validating that an that a, a AI solution is really uh, trustworthy. We're not there yet, and I'm hopeful that we will get there through the Jake and Intel and Oracle and IARPA will help too. Uh, but uh, we need to be very measured in our assessment of when an AI is trustworthy enough to use it in a high impact situation. Thanks, Jeff. Nate, you got the last word. 
Yeah. Um, so thanks for, for inviting me to the panel and meeting everybody here virtually. I'd say, you know, just because we have AI doesn't mean we need it to solve a particular problem or to augment a human or accelerate, right? It's, it's still a tool. It's all about decision-making, problem-solving, and making sure that we can help if we need AI for this, great. Second point is, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more research, so I'll put this in Jeff's lap, around uh, sort of the human threat vectors from a human machine team, right? We're always concerned about adversarial ML from at the poisoning level or evasion level or even inversion level. But if we're truly optimizing an AI system with a human in or on the loop, right, there's these human threat vectors that I don't know if we've fully sort of looked at. Um, and I can give examples, but we're kind of running out of time. Um, and the last point is, I'd say uh, sort of in the, in the same vein um, is that, you know, I just lost, lost my train of thought. Uh, b basically that those, those threat factors are, are really a key, a key thing for us to look at. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I lost my last point. So. Well, I think you talk, you talk about different examples of human machine threat vectors or something that might've been it. Yeah. So if you think of like a, uh, if you think of a, a car, right, a, a self or a, a sort of semi-automated car with a human, right? You know, we have computer vision systems that are able to uh, uh, sort of detect, you know, how far the car is in front of it. And a lot of times that image then goes through a, a common filter and, and sort of creates a sort of other types of coordinates that a computer can use to understand how close we are, far away. And so an adversary, for example, through an evasion attack could put up some, you know, some sort of uh, patch or ghost image, or et cetera, to sort of change what those values are. And that could cause a human to, to make, a, make a decision, right? So there's this human sort of layer there that we have, we have to consider. And that, that reminded me of my last point is this, uh, from an adversarial ML perspective, we've always looked at these sort of static type attacks attacks like uh, at poisoning or evasion, but I'd like to see this area of sort of sequential adversarial machine learning. It could, it could apply to reinforcement learning type problems, but just like, you know, maybe, maybe an adversary wants to come up with an optimal policy of like doing certain perturbations or, or certain things, you know, over time to cause some desired effects. So I'd like to see some research and development in that from an AI security perspective. Great. Thanks, Dave. He threw a lot at you, Jeff. <laughs> Got Listen. it. I want to thank all of you. It was a great, great, great conversation. I really appreciate the time you spent. Thanks so much. Over to you, Megan. Great. Well, th well thanks, Dr. Brothers, and thanks to those panelists. Um, that was a really thought-provoking discussion um, on how we should think about approaching security with AI and ML systems. And Dr. Brothers, maybe we can have you back to elaborate on sort of the AI security kill chain you referenced, because uh, that's a new term for me personally. Um, so again, uh, thanks, thanks to that final panel.